Good morning. I am Pastor Greg McClellan. Welcome to St. Stephen United Methodist Church. We're glad you're with us. For those of you who are viewing at home, we can be found on Facebook Live at our Facebook page, St. Stephen Church, or on YouTube at St. Stephen Today, which is our YouTube page. We're glad you're with us, and join us as we prepare our minds and hearts for worship. Again, I want to welcome you to St. Stephen United Methodist Church. We especially want to welcome any of you who may be viewing our virtual broadcast who are for the first time or if you're not a regular member of our congregation. I also want to remind all of those who see this that while we have not officially reopened our church because of the virus, we have decided to allow those who feel comfortable doing so to come and view the recording of our virtual service. We are following social distancing rules, taking temperatures and sanitizing hands and staying separate. We've also asked the congregation who attend not to sing because that seems to be a more dangerous activity. And, um, but we're glad you're here, and we want to make sure all of those who wish to come are welcome, and at the same time, all of those who are uncomfortable being in a, uh, this environment with the virus, we don't want them to feel obligated to come. Uh, we know that pre-existing conditions are a, a big deal with this virus. Um, but anyway, welcome to everybody. It's a beautiful day. The temperature is nice for November. And uh, apparently we have run out of English names for storms. And we've run out of
Greek names for storms, and we're entering back into a new set of English names for storms. Uh, we've had a pretty stormy year, I guess. I, I don't know what else to say about that. Um, we have some new elected officials who will be taking office the first of the year, and no matter how we may feel about those new officials, we should pray for them and, and pray that they receive God's guidance. Those who will be leaving office, we should pray for them that they are successful in going back into private life. We should also pray for ourselves that we find peace and can let go of the chaos and animosity and anger and ranting and raving that seems to have been so much a part of this election year. And remember that regardless of what our political affiliations are, we're still asked to love each other and to be tolerant with each other and to hold each other up. As we continue to prepare for worship, we're going to continue with some music. Good morning. Our first hymn of praise is uh, in our hymn book, and you have it in your bulletins written. Uh, 715, Rejoice, the Lord is King. So this morning, we wish to continue to pray for those of our congregation who have been facing health challenges. Floyd Polk has been going through cancer treatment. Jean and Sue Smith. Jean has been struggling with health issues now for quite some time. Becky Sago is still seeking guidance as she organizes life without the presence of her mom. 
Margaret Simpson asked for our prayers as she faces medical tests and issues. Mike Holliday, I assume, is still recovering well from back surgery. And you know that anytime something deals with the back, that can be uh, very uncomfortable and frustrating. Margaret Hughes has had some medical issues, but I believe she's coming along fine. She still needs our prayers. Faye New has broken ribs. Tommy and Pam Lowe have asked for prayers. And I believe Beverly has maybe a prayer request for us for your center. Um, we had a friend this week that was um, was found dead in his home. And so he, uh, we just asked for prayers for the family. And, um, Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we hold up all of those who've been named who are struggling, struggling with medical issues, <laughs> those who need your guidance and strength, comforting touch of your hand, the knowledge of your presence. We thank you for all of the many blessings that you have put in our lives, the life of our congregation and church. We ask that you renew our strength, that we may go into the fall and the holiday season with renewed vigor as we try to carry the message to those who do not know your son, help us to remember that there are many who are especially lonely or out of sorts during the holiday season for many reasons, maybe separation from family and loved ones, and that we may be alert and aware enough to be comfort of comfort to those who we meet who fall into that category. We ask that you bless all of our leaders, old and new, and that you help our nation remember that while politics and government officials are important, it is you that we must rely on to meet our needs, to guide our lives, and to help us with the day-to-day -day living in this troubled time. We thank you for the beautiful weather. We ask that you continue to bless our church. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Please join me for our affirmation of faith. If you have a United Methodist hymnal, you can find it on page 881. If you receive our bulletin, you will find it there as well. Or, if you're smarter than me, you may already have it memorized. In any event, join with me as we read the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the 
forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
This morning our opening scripture is taken from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 1 through 3, and then skipping over to 14 through 25. However, for the purposes of this sermon, I have added a scripture from 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. And at first glance, these two scriptures may seem unrelated, but we'll see how maybe they can fit together. In the meantime, please join me for the reading of the Word of God. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods of your ancestors, served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And then in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. I hope that those of you who are in our congregation appreciate the efforts of Beverly and Debbie. Each week they have to look at the scripture that I have selected and try to read my mind about what the service is going to be like. And they don't get a whole lot of help from me. The truth is sometimes I don't know when I select that scripture how the sermon's going to go and sometimes God tells me I'm off on the wrong tangent and changes the plan. I have mentioned to y'all a number of times that I have ongoing education obligations as a pastor and I'm in the middle of taking a class on the early church And that class has strongly influenced this morning's sermon. So our reading from Joshua may not seem to fit right at first, 
But I would say that it fits very well into what we're going to be talking about today. If we are willing to look at things maybe a little different than the way we normally do. What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to love your neighbor? What is self-love? And what does it mean to be perfected in love? Finally, looking at these questions, can looking at how early Christian fathers viewed these questions be helpful to us today? These questions require that we take a hard look at the word love and that possibly we need to be open-minded to some new ideas. In the English language, you can find a list of synonyms for love that refer to affection. They don't really describe what I think of as love. The word adore is the only other word in the English language that I can find that, that has the same meaning as the word love. What this means is that we are limited to a couple of words to cover the many faces and aspects and different forms of love. We have two words. On the other hand, in Greek, there are at least six words that mean love, depending on which aspect of love you're talking about. According to Yes, which is an online magazine, the six Greek words are as follows. Number one, eros, which refers to sexual love. Philia, which refers to deep friendship, or brotherhood. Ludus, which is a form of playful love. Agape, we're familiar with that one. It's a Greek word for selfless love. Pragma means long-standing love. And philodia, is the love of the self. So in other languages, we can express different aspects of love more easily than we can with the words that we have in English. And maybe that's why our, our points of view on the topic of love are somewhat limited. Or maybe it's the other round, way around. Is it possible that we have limited words for love because we have a limited view of what love means and what love is? I would venture to say that most modern Christians are uncomfortable with phrases like perfected in love. Much like many ancient philosophers, we may view the word perfect as describing a static or unmoving state or condition. Because we feel that our, we our human weakness prevents us from becoming perfect, meaning without flaws, we ignore or we outright reject the idea of perfection in love. But this is an error. Perfection in love is scriptural. So if we're uncomfortable with the idea 
We've got to have open minds and we've got to be willing to dig a little deeper and find out what they mean. I've been reading a book called To Love As God Loves, written by Roberta Bondi. And she reveals the writings and attitudes of the early monastic fathers and teachers of Christian love. The monastic fathers are the monks and abbots that started the first monasteries in early Christianity. One such teacher, Gregory of Nyssa, who lived in the fourth century, taught that to be a human being, one has to change. It is the way God made us when God set us in creation, for creation itself is always changing. So we can't view perfect, perfection as a static or unchanging, unmoving condition and at the same time accept it as part of our lives. But we choose to move toward or away from God. It's a choice that we make. In the scripture from Joshua read today, Joshua offers the Hebrews exactly that choice. Choose what God you're going to serve, or if you're going to serve a God. But he states that he and his household will serve God, Jehovah. This demonstrates that love is more than just an emotion. In our culture, when we say the word love, we tend, I believe, to usually think in terms of emotion. But the love that Joshua is talking about is a commitment to act on love. It is not just a feeling, it's an action. As Gregory of Nyssa said, for this is truly perfection, never to stop growing towards what is better and never placing any limit on perfection. Now as Methodists, we have other sources. We have the words of our own John Wesley continue this line of thinking. It's an interesting story. Wesley had been talking to some of his cohorts at Oxford about perfection in love. And just so you don't think that this is something that only lay people struggle with, it's not. It's something that clergy struggle with. It's something that bishops struggle with. It's something that the Pope has struggled with. It's something that the most educated theologians have struggled with. And John Wesley's peers didn't like hearing him talk about humans being perfect either. They didn't believe it was possible because we all have a sense of guilt over our inability to overcome all of our flaws. No matter how devoted to God we are, no matter how hard we try, we come up short. So in self-defense, we don't believe in human perfection. John Wesley was called into the office of his boss at Oxford to be chastised for his belief in human perfection. And by the time they got through with the interview, John was asked to write a sermon based on the things that he had told his boss. His boss was so impressed that he wanted everyone to hear it. We don't really know if John Wesley ever actually preached his sermon on perfection and love, but we do know that he wrote, 
wrote it to stay out of trouble. So in his sermon, he says, ye are perfect men. And this is based on 1 John chapter 2. Ye are perfect men being grown up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Wesley goes on to say, let us press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. So here, both Gregory of Nyssa and John Wesley, a thousand years apart, are using words like growing, or being grown, or press toward to make their points. These words and phrases denote action and change, not an emotion and not a static condition. According to the examples that Roberta Bondi points to in her book, we must look at more than just trying to love or move toward God alone. We are commanded by Scripture and by Jesus Christ to love our neighbor as ourselves. There's two parts to that. The words as ourselves are uncomfortable. They're troublesome to many of us today. For those of us who are Christians, we may feel that self-love is contrary to the image of the humble servant portrayed by Christ. How can I be a humble servant and love myself? How can I be selfless and love myself? It's a complicated issue. For non-Christians, those who are familiar with New Age spiritualism or our modern pop culture, you'll hear many of them say that we must love, love ourselves first before we can learn to love others. That's a prevailing way of thinking in our culture outside the Christian church. We come first. I don't think that's scriptural. It may be one of the reasons that pop culture struggles with us so much. Dorotheus of Gaza was another monk from the 6th century, and he gave a very useful illustration in order to show that loving our neighbor cannot be separated from loving God. He said, each one according to his means should take care to be at one with everyone else. Not almost everyone else, everyone else. For the more one is united with his neighbor, the more he is united with God. That's a troubling thought. Dorotheus elaborates, elaborates using this metaphor, and I wish I had a board up here, and I should have arranged it. But I'm going to try to describe this in a way that makes sense. If you all remember from geometry from high school, one of the tools you had in geometry was a compass. One side of it was a point, and the other side of it was a pen or pencil. And if you put the point down and turned it in a circle, it would make a perfect circle around the point in the middle. So suppose we were to take a compass and insert the point and draw the outline of a circle. The center point is the same distance from any point on the circumference. No matter where on that outline you are, you're the same distance from the center. Let us suppose that this circle is the world and that God himself 
is the center. The straight lines drawn from the circumference to the center are the lives of human beings. So let us assume for the sake of the analogy that to move toward God, human beings move from the circumference along the radii of the circle to the center. So if each point on that circumference is one of us, we're all starting the same distance from God, and we're all starting separate. But if you draw a line from us, from me to the middle, from you to the middle, as we grow closer to the middle, those lines grow closer together. We cannot move toward God without moving toward each other. They go together. The closer they are to one another, the closer they become to God. So we can see that early thought sees love of God and love of nature as mutually inclusive. So what about self-love? Because it says, love your neighbor as yourself. We can't leave that out. St. Anthony the Great sought understanding of the matter of self-love, and he reasoned that we, all of us, are joined together in the body of Christ, which is the church. All of us make up the church. So in reading 1 John chapter 4, St. Anthony saw that whatever good or ill that we do for another person, we do also for ourselves. That's kind of scary. Every time I judge or criticize somebody else, I'm doing it to myself also. It's very scary. So we ought to love one another, for to love the neighbor means to love God. And if we love God, we love ourselves. So if the whole goal of the Christian life is to love, then there is no room for judgment or criticism of others. Humility, commitment, and discipline were a part of monastic life, especially for new members, because those traits were considered important to the growth toward God. And as we have discussed, if we're growing toward God, we're growing toward each other. So since God's love is limitless, and we are made in the image of God, it's right there in the Bible, we are made in His image, then we are not limited in our ability to love. If we are made in God's image, love should be our natural state. But fear, fear of death, fear of loss, fear of shortage, chaos, fear and chaos distort our thinking and our actions. This will not do. We are offered the same choice that Joshua offered the Hebrews. We must choose the God we're going to serve. We can choose to move toward God. 
If we're truly committed to serve the Lord, we are setting out on a path that is more than emotion. It becomes a whole way of being, feeling, seeing, and understanding. So in closing, to love the Lord thy God or to love your neighbor or to properly love yourself are not three separate conditions or actions. Each is intimately connected to the other and must work together toward perfection in love. Amen? closing hymn today of praise is uh, Living for Jesus.
May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Until we meet again. <laughs>